Free, 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 free. Free, 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 free. Free, 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 Free. 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 All right. We are starting a new series today called Free. All right. Well, one day there came into human history a man who had this strange power to set people free. Uh, an adulterous woman who was trapped in her guilt uh, of her affair, a uh, tax collector named Zacchaeus who was a slave to greed, I just want more and more and more and more, a religious leader named Nicodemus who was just blind to his own self-righteous judgmentalism with people, a boat full of disciples who were paralyzed by fear, a Pharisee named Saul who was helpless in the face of uh, the anger inside of him. In every case, these people could not free themselves. But strangely, when they bound themselves to this man, when they abandoned their lives to God and followed this new way of life, they found in this man Jesus their liberation. When they lost their lives, they got them back. He would say strange things to people like, very truly I say to you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. And we think freedom means that we're free to do whatever we want. Jesus says, that way leads to death. Whoever sins is a slave to sin. He said, if the Son has set you free, you are free indeed. And they found this to be true. They would say these remarkable things about Jesus, like it's for freedom that Christ has set us free. Or we are, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And I'm here to tell you today, Jesus still sets people free. A little over 80 years ago, there was a hopeless drunk who became known to history as Bill W. He hit bottom. His addiction to alcohol had put him in jail. Uh, He lost all means for making a living. Uh, He was hospitalized four times. His doctors told his wife, Louise, that she had three choices. Either she could have him locked up, or she could let him go insane, or she could let him die. Uh, Bill knew this was true. Uh, He was desperate. He was hopeless. And then one day, he met a man who invited him into a little fellowship of people who were followers of Jesus. Uh, They were part of something called the Oxford Group. Uh, They were trying to recapture the way of life of the early church, and they devoted themselves to practices like brutal, honest self-examination, confession to each other, making restitution, Uh, seeking to give themselves in humble service and trying to spread this message to other people. And out of that invitation, Alcoholics Anonymous was born. A lot of people aren't aware of this, but AA received from the church, from the scriptures, from Jesus, the gift of these practices, a way of life through which people by the hundreds of thousands receive the power to live a life of freedom, of sobriety, that they could not uh, live through their own power or their own efforts. And this involves steps. Uh, does everyone remember how many steps are associated with AA? 12, 12 steps. Uh, Bill W. actually writes, and you can read about this, that he associated the 12 steps, 12 steps with the 12 disciples of Jesus. Uh, their demonstrated power to change lives is an ongoing reflection of the wisdom and the power of this man, Jesus. And today, we're starting this series on the steps of the spiritual life, really. Not to do an analysis of AA, but because it's time for the church to learn again uh, the power of this person and the way of Jesus Christ. The primary reason this church exists, the primary calling 
for me in being here is so that the presence of Jesus and the way of Jesus might once again shine forth, might once again be experienced in the ordinary daily lives of people like you and me um, as the mightiest force in the world for the transformation of a human life. And there is hope. I'm here to tell you that. There is hope for change. There is hope for healing. There is hope for deliverance. There is hope for freedom. Wherever you are, whatever you've done, wherever you've been, there is hope for freedom. These insatiable longings and thirsts and desires that we all have uh, that become idols and addictions and enslave us and depress us, these longings for more, they exist because we were made for more. And that more exists on the other side of death to self and ego in a spiritual reality, uh, in a transcendent form of life that Jesus called the kingdom of God. A way of life that involves beauty and safety and moral sanity and spiritual power. And the invitation to that life remains the greatest opportunity ever offered the human race. And we can learn, we have to learn, and we will learn how to make discipleship to Jesus, following Jesus, the concrete secret power of our moment-to-moment life. That's why we're doing this series. And where we begin today, the foundation of this power, the foundation of this freedom, the foundation of this life, doesn't initially look like good news at all. Quite the contrary. Uh, Sooner or later in this life, you're likely to ask yourself a question Why do I do what I don't want to do? Why is it I find myself drawn to doing certain things or not doing certain other things, uh, and then my behavior runs the opposite way? I say to myself, whatever I do, I'm not going to eat that. And then I find myself eating that. I say to myself, don't tell her she's like her mother. Like, whatever you do, don't tell her she's like her mother. And then I hear someone say, you're just like your mother. And it's me. I say, I'm not going to yell at my kids. And then I yell at my kids. I say, I'm not going to look at that. And I end up looking at that. I'm not going to drink that. And then I drink it. I'm not going to mess up my relationship. And then I mess it up. I say to myself, instead of avoiding conflict, I'm going to boldly confront. Or instead of worrying... I'm just going to pray, or instead of obsessing, I'm just going to laugh and live with this lightness of spirit today and trust God, and then I find myself doing the very thing I don't want to do. I told myself I wouldn't do. And you know, this is not a small problem for the human race. I mean, marriages get wrecked, families get broken, hearts get shattered, reputations get ruined. I was talking to a woman this week whose dad struggled against something that was destructive in his life for so many years, and he lost that battle, and she's just crushed by it. I know a mom and dad whose son waged war around his demons, and he lost it, and it's just killing them. And because of this strange reality, I can't seem to get myself to do the things that I want to do. Now, there is actually an answer to this question. Uh, Why do I do what I don't want to do? And uh, this answer is terrible, uh, really, but it's the beginning. Uh, It's the first step into the light. It's the first step into uh, freedom. And it's a step that we're going to take today. Uh, Paul described this 2,000 years ago in a way that has yet to be transcended. This is what he writes. I do not understand what I do for what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it's no longer I who do it, but it's the sin living in me that does it. So I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. In other words, the starting point for spiritual life is not what people think it is. It's not, I'll put increased effort into trying to become a better person. It's not, I'm gonna try harder today. I'm gonna try harder to hold my tongue. I'm gonna try harder to be nice to my kids or not look at porn or to read the Bible more. 
The starting point is way deeper. It's way simpler. It's way more disorienting. It's way more humbling and way more overwhelming than that. Here's the first step. And I'm using the wording from Celebrate Recovery, so some of you might know that, uh, that program. I believe this wording applies to all of us. And I'll read it, and then I'd like to have us all read it together out loud as kind of a confession. Um, it's this. I admit I am powerless to control my tendency to do the wrong thing, and my life is unmanageable. And so I want to invite you right now just so that we remember this, and it goes with us, to kind of read this out loud. So if you can sincerely say this as kind of a confession, uh, that would be great. So let's just say it out loud together. I admit I am powerless to control my tendency to do the wrong thing, and my life is unmanageable. See, step one is really nothing more than the acceptance of reality. This, the acceptance of spiritual reality, really the ultimate reality. And the reality is, I'm not in control. I like to hear um, stories of people's lives being transformed. It's probably one of my favorite things. Um, and each week, we're going to have a story uh, of someone whose life is being transformed or has been transformed by the grace and the power and the strength of Jesus. And if you have a story you'd like to share, please email me. Uh, I'd love to hear how you're being set free or how you've been set free. Uh, but today I'd like you to hear uh, James Howard's story. My name is James. I'm a follower of Christ, and I'm also in recovery. When I first came to recovery, I was desperate for change. I, I knew I needed to change this aspect of my life. I was powerless over one part, particular part of my life, but, but I didn't think my life was unmanageable. Um, I really didn't. I, I thought I was a pretty nice guy. I meant well. Uh, people liked me. Um, I, was, I was good. The part of my life with, that was unmanageable was that other people were unmanageable. People made mistakes. They got me in trouble. They didn't support me. Uh, and by people, I mean everyone. I mean my wife, my parents, my children, uh, clerks in the grocery store that didn't check quickly enough, uh, drivers on the highway that didn't drive the way I wanted them to, politicians in Sacramento and Washington and Beijing, uh, their lives were unmanageable. And if they would just do what I suggested they do, I think we'd have a much better world, but they didn't seem to hear me. You would think that I might have turned to God, uh, but I knew God and God didn't help me. As a matter of fact, God had let me down many, many times. Uh, in those mornings in the middle of the night at 2 a.m. when I'd wake up and, and I'd be worried about things I had done and things people were going to do to me or consequences of my behavior. I prayed to God, I, I, I begged God to help me and God didn't seem to listen. God didn't seem to care. And uh, uh, my life, I, I couldn't go to God. That, that just wasn't gonna work for me. As I went about my day, if my life worked well, then I forgot about God. I was like, I don't need God. Look, God, no thanks, I, I got this covered. Don't, don't worry about it. Uh, as a matter of fact, if I need you, God, I'll let you know. Uh, if things went badly for me, then I cursed God. But I kept going to those recovery meetings. I went once a week because I thought, well, if I went to church, I, when I was a kid and went to church, I went once a week. And so once a week should be enough. If, if once a week is enough for the church, it should be enough for these recovery people. I went to these meetings and I, I watched the other people, I listened, I judged them, I coveted them, I envied them, I resented them, I was fearful of them, I lusted for them. I had a lot of feelings, I didn't always say them, but I kept going to the meetings. And they kept welcoming me. They said, James, keep coming back. And so I kept coming to the meetings. And as I came to those meetings, some of this, whatever it was, I now know it was God, started to seep into my life. Staying in the meetings once a week was an, an admission of my powerlessness and my, the, the unmanageability of my life. I didn't know that, and it's probably a good thing, because if I had known that, I probably would have stopped coming. I got better in recovery. My fears, my lust, my anger, my resentment, uh, my life started to be managed by God. And God managed my life much better than I could manage my life. Much to my surprise, I joined a church. I saw people who were in recovery and who worshiped God, the God of my childhood. And they had something I wanted, and I wanted it, and I needed it, and, and I asked them, and they said, uh, go to God, read the Bible, join the church, and so I did. 
and I got better, and it was wonderful. And then as I got better, I started to think, well, I'm pretty good. As a matter of fact, I'm real good. I'm doing great. I can rest on my laurels, and I did. I stopped working my program. As I got better, I started to compare myself to other people. Well, I'm better than they are. I even compared myself to myself. I, I realized the, the, the sins, the problems, the addictions, the habits that I had in recovery and in the church were much bigger than my sins and, and habits and problems before I got into recovery in the church. I thought it's better to defy God on these small things than those big things where I used to defy God. Later I realized there is no small defiance of God. In this life, I think I will always struggle with powerlessness and unmanageability. And I believe God will always be the better answer to my powerlessness and my unmanageability. I do a daily 10 step because I have to check myself daily. I, I'm so prone to falling back to my old ways to define God. Actually, I believe everyone struggles with these issues and everyone has a similar solution. I pray that you find this solution. I thank God because God led me to recovery and I thank recovery because recovery led me to God. And I thank you, Blue Oaks. <laughs>
Okay, so for those of you who don't have your hand raised, do you realize what you're doing right now? <laughs> I'll manage my pain, I'll use alcohol, or I'll watch TV, or use sex, or money, or food, or achievement, or escapism to medicate my pain so that I don't feel it. I'll use noise. You know, we hate silence in our culture because it brings us face to face with our pain. We're just addicted to medicating that. I do sin management, I do guilt management, I hide, I evade, I rationalize, I justify, I deny, I pretend. And it's so insidious, we come to believe that this way of life is just normal. It's not normal, but it is epidemic. And this will go on until you find a, a situation or a circumstance or a relationship that you cannot control. Until you find something that you cannot manage yourself, uh, you may never really find God. Life has a way of making sure something will come your way that you cannot manage. And when that day comes, and I hope it has for you, this, the first step is not to try to fix it. The first step is to admit something. It's the ego that has to die. I, I'm powerless. It's the ego, it's my ego that has to die. And it's only powerlessness that will do that. And this is a strange paradox. And of course, uh, this comes from Jesus. Uh, in death is life. In weakness is strength. Jesus says, very truly I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. You cannot free yourself. I cannot free myself from this. Now this first step, the one we're looking at today, is the one that we all take together. Um, I love this section from the big book. The Alcoholics Anonymous standard text is often called the big book. Uh, it describes how AA brings together people of completely different uh, political opinions, socioeconomic backgrounds, races, and so on. And this is what they say. We are a people who normally would not mix, but there exists among us a fellowship, a friendship, an understanding which is indescribable. We are like the passengers of a great liner the moment after rescued from shipwreck, which camaraderie, joy, joyousness, and democracy pervade the vessel from steerage to captain's table. And if you've ever been to a 12-step meeting, you know it's just this strange assortment of people who would otherwise never come together. But there is this kind of fellowship among them. We are a people who normally would not mix. Well, I want to tell you, that was the church in Acts 2. And that can be our church as well. It's this odd group of people who begin to follow Jesus, Jew and Greek, slave and free, male, free, female, rich, poor, but not just if we meet based around our strength, not if we meet based around our great giftedness or our resources or our potential or education or even our right beliefs, only if we meet based on our powerlessness no. and our weakness and our unmanageability. That's why the prophet Isaiah said, we all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. There's a phrase for this message that I'd like to be kind of a, a liturgy for all of us. The phrase is, that's me. Um, can you all say that? That's me. All right, we're gonna, we're gonna be a that's me church uh, throughout this series. Not like, you know, who took my cup of coffee? That's me. You know, not like that. Not like, you know, I've been praying and praying, God, who am I supposed to marry? You know, that's me. Not like that. Uh, I'm going to walk through steps, uh, step one right now, and at the end of it, I just want to invite you to say with me, that's me, okay? We'll do kind of a that's me liturgy uh, together right now as a church. Here's what step one looks like. I'm a mess on my own. I am powerless over my ego, and my life is unmanageable, and I need God. Like, left to myself, I will waste my one and only life on stupid stuff. I will damage and neglect relationships. I will make idols of success and my re reputation. I will dishonor my sexuality. I will use words which I'm supposed to use for God to deceive people. I'll use people for my own advancement when I'm supposed to serve the church. I'll serve myself instead of serving others, instead of serving you. 
Greed will rule my wallet. Resentments will fill my heart in a nanosecond. Pride will govern my choices. Ego will just dominate my life. Left to myself, I will spend a pathetic existence trying to polish my outer image and hide so no one can see what an egocentric sinner I am on the inside. And if successful in this, I will grow, go to my grave a respectable fraud. I'm a mess, and I need God. And all the people said, that's me. That's what draws us together. It's like the deflation of this godlike ego. You see, we live in a culture that just teaches us, inflate it. But the way of Jesus says, actually, life starts with the deflation of that which our own culture is saying, you know, just pump it up. This is from Tim Keller. Uh, Andrew Del Banco is a humanities professor at Columbia. He started doing research on Alcoholics Anonymous. At one AA meeting in a church basement, he listened to a crispy dressed young man who was uh, talking about his problems. In his narrative, this young man was absolutely faultless. Uh, all his mistakes were due to the injustice and betrayal of others. Uh, his every gesture uh, betrayed his deeply wounded pride and ego. It was clear that he was trapped. Everyone who sins is a slave to sin. It was clear he was trapped in his need to justify himself, and things would only get worse and worse in his life until he recognized this. While he was speaking, a black man in his 40s in dreadlocks and dark shades leaned over to Del Blanco uh, and said, I used to feel that way too before I achieved low self-esteem. <laughs> Del Blanco wrote, this was more than just a clever phrase. As the speaker bombarded us with words like, I have to take control of my life and I have to really believe in myself, the man beside me took refuge in the old Calvinist doctrine that pride is the enemy of hope. This is the beginning of a life of freedom. There is no way to plow around this. It's just death, right? And it hurts. And generally, only desperate people will ever get there. By the way, that's why the more resources you have, uh, the more you make, the more you think, I could just manage this life. The more, you, the more you make, the more danger you're in, actually, Jesus says. This always comes as a shock to people because they think what that means is, like, I'm doing well, I can manage my life because I have more resources. Jesus said to his disciples one day, how hard is it for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of heaven? And you understand that doesn't mean like to get to the good place when you die. That's right here and right now, living in a dependent, humble uh, servanthood to God. And then Jesus said to his disciples, truly I tell you, it's hard for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished and asked, who then can be saved? And Jesus looked at them and said, with man, it's impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Let me ask you a question. Where do rich people live? According to Jesus, they live right next to the gates of hell. They won't know they're powerless because their money will make them think that they can manage their lives. And they might end up greedy and proud and let millions starve while they earn more and save more and spend more. They think they're doing great. By the way, who is rich? And all the people said, that's me. It's the story of the human race. You know, some of you know about the story that hit the news recently about James McDonald. He's a pastor out in Chicago who was fired from his church for his inappropriate behavior with staff and elders. Um, and here's this incredible pastor. He's incredibly successful. He's famous. He's bright. Uh, and either intentionally or unintentionally, he let his ego um, get the best of him. He let that little ego voice inside of him say, you can control the people around you. You can control the finances. You can control everything because you're smart and people like you. And then when he falls, 
which is expected in situations like this, when you're in a position where you have no accountability and you, know, you have all the authority, uh, you're bound to fall. And then you just watch the response on the internet of pretty much everyone, all kinds of people who step forward and they're like, let's kick him while he's down. Let's destroy him even more. Then I can feel a little more puffed up myself because, of course, I would never do anything like that. Question, when are you done with step number one? You know, in the church, a lot of times, people want kind of a checklist for discipleship so that we can feel like, well, I can check off this box. You know, I can uh, move on to advanced discipleship now. You know, been there, done that. When are you done with step one? Never. We are people who normally would not mix, but we share this question. Why do I do what I don't want to do? We're not united by our backgrounds. We're not united by uh, political opinions or racial demographics or educational levels or vocational status. Those things mean nothing here. But there exists among us a fellowship, a friendship, an understanding that is indescribable. We are like the passengers of a great liner in the moment after rescue. You know, what unites us is this and only this. We are powerless Messed up sinners who desperately need God. If you're a mess, welcome home. If you're not a mess, stick around and hopefully we'll help you to achieve self, low self-esteem. <laughs> when someone comes to an AA meeting, the first time they stand up to share, uh, to tell their story, they often begin by saying, my name is John and I'm an alcoholic. And the first time someone says those words publicly is a very powerful moment. And everyone responds by saying, hi, John. In other words, they're saying, that's me. If someone has attended for 20 years and has not had a drink for two decades, they'll stand up and say, my name is John. I'm an alcoholic. If someone uh, first came like 20 years ago to a meeting, they fell off the wagon the first week, they came back, they fell off the wagon again, they failed like a hundred times. If they come back the hundredth and first time, they'll say, my name is John, I'm an alcoholic. And you know what everyone says back? Hi, John. Not because it's okay to keep trashing your life, but because they battle a great enemy and life and death are on the line. And they simply cannot afford a posture of superiority or judgmentalism because that's ego. And ego means slavery, and slavery means death. Some of you have been hiding for so long, and it's just killing you. Drinking or drugs or sex or pain of one sort or another or anger, or you don't even know if this life is worth living. You know, this week... We're all going to work on step one. That is don't try harder. Like don't resolve to improve yourself. Just God, you're God. And I'm not. I'm not this week. I'm powerless over sin. My life has become unmanageable. And then look for where am I playing God? Like honestly, God, like show me where I'm sitting on the throne. Help me to see reality. Don't think because you're a Christian that you've done step one already. This is from Richard Rohr. Uh, Christians are usually sincere and well-intentioned people until you get to any real issues of ego, control, power, money, pleasure, and security, then they tend to be pretty much like everyone else. It looks like this. I was invited recently to tell the story of starting Blue Oaks and the success that we've had as a church. And um, at this event, a man came up to me and started to tell me how successful his church plant is. And the first thought that came to my mind is like, how self-centered of you? Like, we're not here to talk about your success, we're here to talk about my success. (laughs) And I'm thinking like, God, would you just kill that in me? Because I can't, and it's killing me. I can't even manage my own thoughts. I'll tell you how destructive this is for me. I was praying this week about this message, and then I had this thought. I can tell the congregation how important this step is. And then my next thought was to picture me giving a powerful message where people are impressed by this humble message that I'm giving. 
I can't even worship God for 30 seconds without starting to worship my own ego. I have issues. And all the people said, that's me. In AA, they say step one is the only step that we have to actually do perfectly out of all 12. This is the one that you have to do perfectly. That doesn't mean you have to feel it perfectly or think it perfectly. They say that because as long as I'm convinced that I could manage my life, I will manage my life. That's why in the New Testament, there are these people who reject Jesus, like the rich young ruler or the Pharisees or Nicodemus. They, their lives had not become unmanageable yet. They had not reached Christianity 101. They weren't ready for that. And I just want to ask you this week, find some people to talk about this with. Um, we want to be a that's me church where uh, no matter where you've been or what you've done, I mean, you could just, we can all just say it, hey, that's me, because that's the gospel. So if you're in a small group, uh, I would say do it there. Um, if you're not in a small group, you might want to join a small group. In AA, they say, little good can come to an alcoholic who joins AA unless he has first accepted his devastating weakness with all its consequences. Now, where did they get that idea? Like, where did they get this idea that a public confession of personal fail failures and weaknesses is actually the first step toward a freedom, a life of freedom and power? I'll tell you where they got it. It's a friend of Jesus named John. He said, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins. The church is to be this place where followers of Jesus are trained to tell their stories as repentant, recovering sinners. James said, therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. So just for practice, this week in your small group, just confess one small, safe-to-describe, real-life sin, okay? Um, if you can't think of a sin that you've actually committed, just make one up. And then you can confess to lying uh, in your confession. Because the church is a place where followers of Jesus are trained to tell our stories as repentant sinners. Kent Dunnington says this, of course, many of us are not sure we want to be in a church that so trains us. For that would entail not only our humiliation, but also a vulnerability to others in which many of us have no interest. We're afraid that if we confess our sins, other people might make claims on our lives by insisting on praying for us and asking how we're doing. Most of us are not sure we want church to be that involved. But God is that involved. On the cross, God got that involved. On the cross, Jesus took our sin and our guilt and our addictions and our brokenness. On the cross, Jesus said to death on our behalf, that's me. Break me. Bruise me. Crush me. Take me. So that through Jesus, we could go to God and say, that's me. Love me. Heal me. Raise me up. God can do that. But that's step two. You're going to have to come back for step two next week. Would you bow your heads right now with me? Just kind of do this step one right now as best you can, just asking God to help you. God, I just acknowledge to you right now that I am powerless over my sin. My life without you is unmanageable. God, would you lead us? And we ask this in Jesus' name. Everyone said?